Okay, so we're... Good morning and welcome to this session, an idea and insight uh, with Professor Joseph Stiglitz. Uh, this session is being live streamed in the um, World Economic Forum's website and uh, you can send uh, questions if you're hearing from outside of, of uh, this hall uh, to the hashtag equal growth and we'll get uh, some of those questions hopefully um, in time. Uh, professor Stiglitz is a university professor at Columbia University. He's also the founder and co-president of the university's initiative for public dialogue. He has taught at Princeton, Stanford, MIT, and Oxford. He has been a member and chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors during the Clinton administration, and also chief economist and senior vice president of the World Bank. Uh, Professor Stiglitz uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics for his analysis of markets with asymmetric information, and was a lead author of the 1995 report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which also received uh, the Nobel Prize. He's also uh, a very um, prominent author. He has authored many books, um, to name a few, Globalization and Its Discontents, The Roaring Nineties, Making Globalization Work, The Price of Inequality, and most recently, just published this year, The Great Divide, Unequal Societies, and, wha and What We Can Do About Them. Professor Stiglitz, it's an honor to have you with us in um, Riviera Maya. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Um, we're going to have um, uh, a dialogue with Professor Stiglitz, and um, uh, towards the last 15, 20 minutes, we're going to also open up for your questions. Um, uh, Professor, you've uh, spoken extensively um, and written extensively about inequality, uh, uh, namely in your uh, uh, past couple of books. And we've seen that most of the world has become more unequal during the past decade. Even in, in advanced OECD economies, uh, the gap between rich and poor is at its worst level uh, during the past 30 years. Also in Asia, in fast-growing Asian economies, we've seen um, inequality de deteriorate. And Latin America has been uh, an exception to this trend. Uh, what do you think Latin America did w well between 2002 and 2012 to see inequality decrease in virtually every Latin American country with the exception of Guatemala and some periods also Costa Rica and Paraguay? Yeah, the point you raise, I think, is a really important one. It's something I've stressed in my work. Uh, a lot of people looking at the United States, Europe, and all these countries with increasing inequality have said, oh, it's inevitable, it has to do with uh, the laws of economics, with technology, with globalization. And the fact that Latin America, you know, same global economic forces, you've actually become more globalized in, in the last 15 years, uh, have bucked the trend says it's not about technology, globalization. They may have a part to it, but it emphasizes that it's about the policies. Uh, and that says it's a, it's a matter of choice. It's the how we structure the economy. It's the rules that we put together. So for instance, uh, one of the big successes is, is in Brazil, where you had a succession of presidents, uh, uh, Cardoza, uh, began some very important education policies where uh, made a very big effort to make sure that there was uh, much more widespread education than in the past. And then President Lula had all these programs uh, that were focused on hunger, uh, on uh, health, continued the education programs. And then I, I have to say there was a lot of innovativeness. You know, you talk about Everybody talks about, uh, especially at Davos, and uh, innovation, but there was a lot of social innovation. I think we sometimes underestimate the importance of social innovation. And one of those was the conditional cash transfer. So you provided a framework that really encouraged people to make sure that their children got the education that they needed, got the vaccinations they needed, and the food they needed. So it really, uh, I mean, it, it was really one of the real successes uh, Latin America has been really one of the uh, successes around the world. Yes, and I think uh, Mexico is also uh, a good example of the conditional cash transfer programs <clears throat> that has gone, you know, for three administrations now. Um, it started during the Cedillo administration, like Progresa, 
then during the Fox administration, opportunidades during uh, Calderon administration as well, and now during President Peña continues as Prospera. So it's also a, a good example of conditional cash transfer. And one of the things I think that's been very strong uh, about this issue in Latin America is that it, you might say it's bipartisan. It's both center left and center right governments. So it's not, you know, this issue of inequality is not seen as a partisan issue. It's seen as something that if a society is going to function, there can't be too much of an extreme. That's right. And um, you mentioned Brazil as one of the successful examples, and, and I completely agree. Also, you know, we've seen uh, that uh, not only did they reduce inequality, but also alleviated uh, poverty uh, to significant uh, amounts of the Brazilian population. Also, Argentina, you know, achieved uh, some uh, decrease in inequality. However, we see that these two countries are now facing um, economic and political crisis, and, and uh, uh, the forecast is that this year the Argentinian and the Brazilian economies are going to shrink by 1% in Argentina, by 1.5% in uh, Brazil. Do you think these achievements in inequality and poverty alleviation can be sustained with a shrinking economy? I think they can be sustained. <laughs> the issue is, is will they be sustained? You know, should you treat poverty as uh, alleviation, reduction of poverty as a luxury good? That when things are going well, uh, you you have some of it, but when things go bad, you you put it on the side. Or should you think about it as basically a, a core of the economic program? And let me uh, tell you, you know, how I think about it. Um, and this represents, I think, one of the biggest change, two of the biggest changes in how we see inequality today, rather, compared to 20 years ago. The first is that uh, we used to think that there was a trade-off. The economists love trade-offs. So you could have more equality or more growth. But if you wanted more equality, you'd have to give up on growth. Now we see the two as complements that you can have stronger growth if you have, if you reduce the extremes of inequality. And we're not talking about getting rid of inequality, it's reducing the extremes. And that was the, one of the main points of my book, The Price of Inequality. What, what I, uh, the, I chose the title to emphasize that we pay a very high price for excessive inequality, particularly inequality that comes from monopoly power, you know, lack of competition. You know about that here in Mexico. Uh, the, the, uh, you, know, you pay a high price from inequality that comes from lack of educational opportunity for everybody. Again, something that you know about here. Uh, so there are all these, these aspects that if you don't get them right, you get more inequality and lower growth. That's the, the, the first, I think, important thing to realize, that, that they shouldn't uh, give up on their attempts. And the second one is that these are long-run issues. So it's, to use an American colloquial, it's penny-wise and pound-foolish. That is, it's very foolish to cut back on education today or, for, or, or one of these basic programs that are directed at reducing inequality and helping uh, and reducing poverty, it's foolish to cut back on those because that will lower the long-term potential growth. Um, just as a little bit of an aside, you know, if we have time later on, we'll, we'll talk about Europe. One of the big mistakes that Europe is making now are the extreme cutbacks, you know, the extreme austerity. And in many of the countries, those cutbacks are going to have results that will lower the growth potential, not only the growth today, you know, we all know that growth today has been a disaster, but lower the growth potential for the next quarter century. Well, well I think it's, it's great news that, you know, finally um, it's no longer conventional wisdom that there's a trade-off between growth and equality, but uh, actually that they're complementary and, and uh, countries that are more equal can actually grow faster. Um, Latin America's growth story has been quite erratic. Uh, you've seen periods of uh, uh, rapid growth in some countries followed by slow or zero growth. I think with the exception of Chile, most uh, Latin American countries have had very erratic growth patterns. Why do you think Latin America has underperformed in terms of economic growth relative to 
other regions like East Asia and Southeast Asia? Well, there, there, there are a couple uh, aspects of that. You mentioned the erratic. Uh, one of the reasons for the erratic growth is there's been the excessive dependence on natural resources without creating the framework that has to respond to the huge volatility in the prices of those. And that's where Chile has been the exception. They created the stabilization fund, and that stabilization fund has enabled them to weather the copper prices go up and down, and you would have thought, given their historical dependence on copper, that that would have led to uh, huge volatility in their economy, but they created the stabilization fund. So that's the first thing they did. The second thing that Chile did was diversification of their economy. Um, the government and a, a foundation that was basically uh, created as part of a settlement of a complex I issue, but created an industrial policy. So it went from an excessive uh, focus on copper to, you know, now they, they export uh, fish, uh, the berries that we eat uh, all year round in the middle of the winter. A lot of them come from, from Chile. Wine. Wine, lumber. Uh, so, and that, to come back, that's one of the successes of Mexico over the last 20 years. Uh, you went from being very heavily dependent on oil uh, for your GDP to one to a much more diversified economy, and that's one of the reasons. You know, things are slowing down, but it's still uh, because of your huge ma manufacturing base, uh, exports to the United States. You've been able to stabilize. So, those are the you know the, the two things in terms of how do you manage these uh, um, uh, the volatility. One is to create a stabilization fund. Uh, which Chile has done, but most of the other countries have not. And the other one is diversify the economy. Yeah, in fact, there's um, also a planned um, stabilization fund in Mexico um, uh, that is part of the energy reform. And um, uh, the sad part is that, you know, we started the stabilization fund when the oil prices went down. <laughs> so but hopefully one day they will go up and there will be excess, you know, uh, cash to put in. Yeah, the but fund. I do hope that when the oil price comes down and the, and the, and the, the uh, uh, budget looks very tight, you don't join Europe in your austerity, because yeah. that we know the results of austerity, uh, lower growth, bigger de deficits, more inequality. Yeah. Well, um, I'm talking a little bit about Mexico. You know that um, you know, over the past year and a half, two years, there's been a, an impressive set of uh, structural reforms that have been approved by Congress, uh, proposed by President uh, Peña Nieto's administration. And um, they range you know, from education to labor, energy, telecom, finance, fiscal, competition. And uh, we all hope that you know, those reforms will, will spur um, higher growth. Um, in your illustrious career, not only as an academic, but also as a policymaker, both in the Council of Economic Advisors and at the World Bank, I'm sure you've seen a, a good deal of attempts, uh, successful and uh, unsuccessful attempts to reform. So um, I would like to, to ask you, um, what do you expect uh, that we could see from these reforms in, say, five to 10 years? And what advice would you give the Mexican government and Mexican society at large uh, to make sure that these reforms are successful? Well, let me say, I, I, from what you've got, done so far, it, it is very impressive. You know, uh, I've, I've uh, watched uh, Mexican economic policies for, for a long time, and, and on a lot of the issues, there was consensus about what should be done, but the politics made it very difficult. And uh, there was a kind of gridlock, yeah. a little bit like we see in the United States. And you broke through it uh, in the last couple of years. And I think that's a, 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 real, a real achievement. Um, I'm actually very optimistic that, that these will uh, really spur economic growth. Um, you know, you take, take uh, uh, issues, you know, uh, prices of telecom, prices of electricity, are basic cost of production. And they make it more attractive. 
uh, for f firms to come invest and for Mexican firms to invest. So I think it's a, it's a, it can be a real spur of economic growth. But let me come back to the issue of inequality, which is the theme why, why I think if they're done right, and it looks like they're do, being done right, I think they, they will really enable Mexico to address the issues of inequality or you know, reduce the inequality through a couple channels. First of all, um, when you have a monopoly and you don't have enough competition, what monopolies do is lead to a higher prices. When you have higher prices, that's a reduction in the real wage, wages adjusted for prices for inflation, just as much as lowering the nominal wage. So when prices, uh, when you have the monopoly going up, it actually uh, takes away real income from ordinary citizens. Uh, you know, in the United States, we're having a big debate about inequality too, just like many other countries. And one of the focus that we're saying is that there's, there's actually a lot of hidden monopolies all over our economy. Uh, they weren't quite so obvious as in, in Mexico, but, but I think attacking these monopolies is important uh, for inequality. But the second one is, if you're gonna attract, in a, for a small economy comp in a very competitive world, if you're going to attract businesses, if you have high electricity prices or high telecom prices, you have to be competitive in some other dimension. And what is the other dimension? Lower wages. So it drives down the nominal pay wages, it drives up the cost of basic uh, things like uh, telecom and, and, and electricity. And so these reforms will, will give us space for uh, uh, higher real incomes of most people on both accounts. There's a third important aspect, and that really goes to how you use the oil revenue. You know, uh, we, we talked about creating a stabilization fund. One of the, uh, and, and, and there's been this um, global discussion of what are called the natural resource curse, that countries with a lot of natural resources often don't do very well. And uh, Venezuela is now a poster child for, for that. You, if you don't manage your resources, uh, you're not gonna grow well. And in a way I sometimes put it is, natural resources are like an asset, a capital good. It's beneath the ground, and if you don't convert that asset beneath the ground into an asset above the ground, into human capital, physical capital, infrastructure, technology, then you're poor because right. you've diminished the assets you had hidden below the ground and you don't have anything to show for it. So it seems to me that a first part of this should be to think, you know, to say all the revenue or a lot, a very large fraction should go into some form of investment, human capital, infrastructure capital. But the other point that is very striking about the natural, about countries with this natural resource curse, with, uh, who have the good luck to have oil, or, uh, is not only don't they grow as fast, they tend to have more inequality. The, you would think that with a natural resource, you would have less inequality. Why do I say that? If you tax work, you might not work as much. If you tax savings, you might not save. If you tax the oil, it can't get angry with you and say, I'm gonna to go to another country. You know, it's there. And so by taxing it, it, I mean, in some sense, and Mexico has had the right philosophy. You said the natural resources belong to all the people. And therefore, they're part of the country's patrimony and they should be shared in a fair way, in a way that reflects basic philosophical principles of, of how you, you share a, a good fortune. You know, good. Unfortunately, most countries don't do that. Most countries take this natural asset that belongs to all the people and it goes to the elite. And that's why, you know, before Chavez arrived on Venezuela, two thirds of that country were in poverty. The richest country in terms of natural resources in Latin America, and yet, the money was staying at the top and wasn't being shared. 
But Venezuela is nowhere near as bad as many of the other countries around the world with natural resources. So that's the third thing that I just would want to emphasize in the reforms. You have to think about not only stabilizing, but also making sure that the revenues are invested and particularly invested in people in ways that create more equality, and particularly more equality of opportunity, uh, and that will lead to more growth. Just to mention one more, uh, just a little anecdote uh, story. Um, I was talking to the uh, Prime Minister of Norway uh, last year, and uh, she said that uh, they invested uh, a lot of their oil revenue on gender equality to make sure that uh, women can enter the labor force, that they had childcare and women's education and all that. And she said that they now get more money from the returns to their investments in women than they do from oil. Now, you know, I don't know how you precisely do that calculation, but the spirit of that, I think, was, was one of the reasons why Norway is one of the countries that has not had an increase in inequality, that has managed to continue to grow very rapidly, and has now put aside in their stabilization fund, in their, in their, in their uh, sovereign wealth fund, almost a trillion dollars for five million people. Yes. No, and I think uh, through that uh, uh, sovereign wealth fund, they've secured higher education for all Norwegians in I don't know how many generations to come, which I think is uh, the right approach. I think, I mean, I couldn't agree more that the best investment, the wisest investment is uh, in people. And um, uh, talking about people and, and human capital, I think uh, uh, we could say that the, probably the most underutilized asset in Latin America is human talent. And, and we've seen that, you know, Latin American 15-year-olds underperform in the PISA examination of the OECD. Um, actually, over 50% of 15-year-olds uh, uh, in Latin America, of, of those countries that take the exam, uh, perform so low that they receive uh, scores of zero or one in the exam, which is basically you don't have basic uh, capability of doing basic arithmetic or uh, making a basic inference from a text. Um, you just uh, published well, a couple of years ago uh, this new book on um, creating a learning society. What would you recommend um, to Latin American you know, governments and societies um, to, to be better at, at learning? And, uh, and also given the fact that you know, the political cycle is usually you know, uh, short and, and uh, you know, the, the benefits from investing in education you are seeing in the long run, how can we incentivize governments to think more about the central you know, uh, importance of education? Yeah, no, I, I, I'm very glad you raised that question. Uh, one of the, the main th thrust of the point uh, of my book, Creating a Learning Society, that will be coming out, I, I think, in Spanish in not, not too long, uh, is the following, that if you look across history, uh, for a thousand, hundreds of years, standards of living were, didn't change from uh, over 2,500, 3,000 years. And then suddenly, around 1750, 1800, you know, 250 years ago, you see this flat curve suddenly bend up. And you ask the question, what changed in the world? And what changed, I think, is the, uh, we call it the enlightenment, the idea that change was possible, but that it was only as a result of learning, of the scientific method, you know, uh, systematic uh, studying and conveying of information, and creating, and what I describe here uh, in this book is creating a learning society uh, where uh, you, you, not only do you learn, but the information is transmitted, the knowledge is transmitted, transmitted throughout society. So the, and I think, this has really become even more important for all countries as the pace of innovation increases um, that, you know, we talk now about lifelong learning, that there's a formal period of education, but then the informal. And the internet has, for instance, changed this uh, a great deal. It used to be that, you know, we jokingly would say that we try to stuff as much knowledge in kids in the first 
uh, 16, you know, 12 years, 16 years, 20 years of school, and then they hope that it stays relevant the rest of their life. Now we don't have to do that. What we have to teach them is how to access information, how to learn, how to make judgments, you know, how to, how to evaluate the knowledge they're getting, and how to continue to learn, uh, because what is relevant uh, today is not going to be relevant in, in 25 years. So you have to think of the whole society, not just one thing, but the whole society as a learning process. And recognize in every society there are impediments uh, to the flow of knowledge. And uh, so that's why I call it creating a learning society. It wasn't just increasing the capabilities of individuals. That's what you do in the formal schooling. But also create a framework for continuing the learning after and to make uh, a framework in which people can continue to share knowledge, um, remove some of the impediments, open up. Next, having an open society is very important to that. Uh, so that's sort of the, 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 the basic uh, framework for thinking about, about this. But core of that is having a good edu formal education system. Right. And that's why the reforms here in, in Mexico on, on education reform, just the beginning, um, but it's a, a big change. I think, some, I think some people think that this may turn out to be the most important reform yeah. that, that has been happened. I'm, I'm one of those. I think the energy reform has received uh, most of the attention, but I think in the long run, the educational reform will be probably the, the most transformational. Um, Shifting a little bit to, to the trade arena, because uh, uh, among the many topics that you um, have written about is, is trade. And uh, right now there's a major trade agreement under negotiation among 12 countries of the Pacific Rim, including five uh, in the Western Hemisphere, Canada, the US, Mexico, Chile, and Peru. Um, uh, what are your thoughts about the potential of the Trans-Pacific Partnership? Uh, of the impact, the cost, the benefits of this vast and ambitious trade agreement? Well, first, you, you have to understand, this is not basically a trade agreement. <laughs> they call it that. But one of the things that we teach in our school of public policy uh, is uh, whatever you see a bill or something, it's usually just the opposite. <laughs> so if it's called a free trade agreement, it means it's a managed trade agreement. And it typically uh, uh, is not managed for the benefit of everybody in the world. It tends to be managed for particular interest. But it's not a trade agreement for another reason. Tariffs have already come down very low, except in some very sensitive areas. I don't think you can expect the U.S. to say, we'll get rid of our agricultural subsidies, we'll get rid of our tariffs on our sensitive sectors, you know, because the, the special interests in those sectors are very strong. And when I've talked to people involved in negotiations, there doesn't seem to be much movement on the tariffs. You know, there'll be a little, but, and they'll give them a lot of advertisement, but those are not what this is really about. There are two things that, that uh, have gotten me, and I think a very large fraction of Americans very three things that actually gotten us very concerned. The first is how the negotiations are going on. Total, you know, secrecy. Now, I'm going to make a few comments uh, about uh, what's in the agreements. You can say, how do I know? Well, the wonderful thing about America is everything leaks. So, uh, WikiLeaks, uh, uh, you know, WikiLeaks has, has, has given us a lot. So we know what's in there, but the USTR is really undermining our democracy. You know, you have a Freedom of Information Act, we have a Freedom of Information Act. So they've responded to the efforts of the public to understand what's going on by labeling this classified, top secret, sort of like designing a nuclear bomb. Well, it is a nuclear bomb on our country, maybe, but. <laughs> Uh, we're not allowed to see what, what they're negotiating because they uh, they, they've classified it. But as I say, fortunately, not only do we know it from, um, from WikiLeaks, actually, some of, I've talked to most of the trade negotiators from other countries on some of the issues, 
Uh, so we know it from the other side, what, what is being asked. There, and so, so this process is very undemocratic. The, some people get to see it and are actually at the, almost at the bargaining table, but civil society, citizens groups uh, are not. Even some congressmen have not been able to see it. So, but the, the other, the provisions, there are two provisions that are, are very, uh, that have, have been the focus of uh, opposition. And I want to, you know, emphasize this because some people think it's the, the opposition is anti-trade. It's not. It's not against trade. Be, you know, if it were a, a true trade agreement, they'd be for it. There are two provisions. One is the legal framework, uh, this investor state dispute resolution mechanism. Um, where a private investor can sue uh, a government, Mexican government is sued, being sued under Chapter 11, um, and uh, the, um, in, a, in a private, very expensive arbitration panel with arbitrators with all kinds of conflicts of interest without any judicial process that United States, and we've been telling, working with other countries to establish a rule of law. A rule of law means processes of appellate, precedence, a whole openness and transparency. None of that is in this judicial process. And um, the result of this is, that, uh, and you can be sued for a loss of expected profits in the future from a change in the regulation to protect health, safety, environment, any aspect, even financial sector. So, you know, financial uh, instability. So anything you can be sued on, and you can be sued for the loss of profits that you expect to get in the future. Now, this is not just a theoretical possibility. Let me just describe one example. Uh, Uruguay uh, passed a regulation that said you have to label cigarettes packages with, this is hazardous for your health. You have that regulation in Mexico. They didn't used to have that regulation in Uruguay, but they passed it. And uh, uh, they went a little bit graphic, a little bit like you do in Mexico, but not like we do in the United States. They would show what a, lungs, a, a lung looked like if, it, if somebody smoked. And guess what? It discouraged people from smoking. That was its intent, <laughs> was to make people see what was happening. Philip Morris says, because people aren't buying cigarettes, we're losing money. We're not making our expected profits. So in Uruguay and in Australia, they're suing the government. They're suing the government because it's trying to stop people from killing their citizens. <laughs> it's costing the government for health care. Because, uh, you know, they, when your lungs collapse, you go to the hospital, and many of the people are poor, and they're... Um, it's so expensive that Uruguay can't pay the legal costs. So fortunately, Mayor Bloomberg in New York and some other rich Americans have come to the help of Uruguay to protect it against an American company suing Uruguay to kill people in Uruguay with regulations that are the same as we have. So this is one example, but this would be pervasive. Now the United States says to American citizens, and you should know this, the U.S. has only been sued 19 times, and has, or 13 times, and has never lost. Really? But Mexico and Canada, other countries have been sued and have lost. Why? Well, we have very expensive, good lawyers. <laughs> this is not a question of principle. Some of them may be here in the audience. but. <laughs> Uh, they're good lawyers, and you, you, you know you can win. But what, what I tell the Americans now is, if we sign this agreement with, with Japan and with Europe, they have good lawyers too. And other countries are going to figure out, you know, there, there's no patent on the legal process. <laughs> and so we will lose, in the United States, Mexico will lose. So I think this is, you know, this is a real step back and in, in a judicial standard, I had fought, the reason I feel so intensely is I had fought exactly the same kind of provision 
when I was in the White House, when I was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, I said, this is really bad for our society. If you want to have a debate about whether you should have cigarette regulation, let's have a debate, have Congress, you know, have the citizens engaged in it, but don't bury it in a treaty where if you change the regulation, you can get sued. So that's the one provision. The other one is intellectual property rights. You know, everybody recognizes intellectual property rights are important. But the question is getting the right balance. Access to information versus incentive to, to uh, innovation. And in the United States, we got that balance uh, in what is called the Hatch-Waxman Act. But basically, the result of that is that 87% of all drugs are generics. And that keeps the prices down. And the other 13% are the high-priced drugs, and they make the money to, to pay for the innovation. So we had a balance. They're now trying to upset that balance. And to me, you know, I find it so shocking because the signature achievement of Obama has been Obamacare. The result of this will be that higher drug prices in all the countries of the world, the United States and all the countries, the countries which have a public health care system, their budget's going to be busted, but those who don't have health insurance aren't going to be able to afford it. So, um, you know, and, and, and the interesting thing is there are some provisions that the USTR, our trade representative, are negotiating, which even the president opposes, I believe, right. that I've heard from, <laughs> but, uh, the USDR said, this is just our negotiating position, but he's twisting arms so much that he'll probably win, and then the United States will be stuck with a provision that is even bad for the United States. Well, thank you for, for um, uh, sharing your thoughts on the TPP, I think. By the way, you, you figured out I was against it. Yeah, of course, <laughs> slightly, <laughs> just slightly. <laughs> I think it's a good time to clear. open okay. it up for uh, questions from the audience. Uh, let's take three. Uh, uh, we have one here, one here, please. Uh, if you can uh, bring the mic up front, please. Thank you. Alejandro, Professor Stiglitz, congratulations. Uh, Daniel Aniello from Accenture. What, what, what's your take on the inequality and technology? And uh, being very brief, two schools of thought. One, that it's actually empirically proven that technology has bred growth, and growth, of course, uh, you know, breeds equality to some degree. But then, as you have recently saw, there are some examples of companies with a very little uh, base of uh, job growth that are creating astounding amounts of wealth. And, uh, I'm, you know, taking technicalities aside, the Keystone XL pipeline, for instance, was an example that some people say that it would have created net dozens of jobs rather than thousands. So, so, so how does this go with uh, reducing inequality? What's your, what's your point of view on this? Yeah. No, that's a really good question. Should we take two more okay. so that you can take the full round because we're running out of time? Yes, please. Thank you. Sorry. Go ahead, and please make the questions short. Yes, okay, so um, I've uh, read you being quoted before that uh, something along the lines that there's no magic bullet against uh, inequality, um, but uh, this question, um, basically, do you, in your experience or in your studies, have you found that um, countries with uh, economies or governments that are more centralized um, are more successful at reducing inequality and promoting growth, uh, say, I'm using the example perhaps of Chile and uh, Mexico, which in, in practice has historically been more centralized, um, uh, as opposed to c countries with uh, less centralized economies. Thank you. And we'll take the last one. Uh, yes, please, uh, the lady here, uh, please. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much, Professor Stiglitz. Uh, my question is about any advice you could give to countries and companies that want to be involved in countries' um, economic development through unleashing entrepreneurship and innovation and empowering women to be participants and active participants in entrepreneurship and innovation. Thank you. Okay, uh, um, uh, there's a famous uh, 
joke in the United States it goes something like, uh, forecasting is always difficult, especially in the future. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the, the uh, uh, and you know, everybody talks about a two-handed economist, so I'm gonna give you a two-handed uh, uh, answer. Uh, the fact is, uh, I do think, I, I am worried about the effect of uh, changes in technology, unless we do something about it, on inequality. Uh, a lot of people say that, uh, yes, uh, technological change has always destroyed jobs. Uh, the the develop, uh, invention of the automobile destroy, destroyed buggy whips and all kinds of things, but they say the, that was followed by the cars, you had a car repair, you have all kinds of industries that grew and those new jobs were more than the old jobs. We can't tell you what the new jobs are going to be, but the, the, there's always going to be new jobs replacing old jobs. That's an important insight. But on the other hand, we've never been in a situation where we have machines that are not only stronger than most of us, unless you're you know, Terminator 5 or one of <laughs> they're stronger than us, and uh, I hate to, they're, they're I don't want to say they're brighter, uh, but they can do some things much better than we can intellectually. You know, they can do calculations. Um, you know, we used to, it, it, just to give an example, you know, we used to, when we were a kid and we watched trains go by, we would be, have a challenge to see whether we could add up 10 digit numbers as fast as the train would go by. It's no problem for a computer to do that. But for most kids, they can't do that. So that's the sort of intellectual challenge. We know that machines can process numbers, digital information, a lot better than we can. So there are machines we've created, that is so it's part of us, we've created machines that are stronger and can do many things better than us. And that means that they will replace uh, many of us. Um, and so I think there is a real risk of increasing unemployment I think we can manage it in some sense. If you go back, I talked about historically that uh, incomes have been the same for hundreds and hundreds of years until about 1800. Um, Keynes wrote a, a very interesting uh, uh, essay about 75 years ago where, uh, uh, called, uh, uh, where he po pointed out that until just not very long ago, uh, most people had to spend all of their life doing nothing but making the basic necessities of life. Uh, food, shelter, clothing. And then suddenly with this increase, they had more leisure time to the point now where most of us would, would work two or three or four hours a week for meeting the basic necessities. And the question that Keynes posed is, what are we gonna do with the rest? And he was worried that we would not be able to spend our time and leisure. He hoped that they would be culture, it would be ideas, meetings like this. I don't know if he could have envisaged that, but, but idea, people engaged in, in thinking. Um, if you look around the world, Americans have actually wound up working more than they used to, and Europeans working less. So there's been different choices. If everybody tries to work more and more, then we have a real problem. If we, we have constructive you know, leisure, I think we can, we, and, and shared, sharing the growth that occurs, then our society can function. If we don't, I think we're gonna have real problems. So I, I think that, uh, uh, I think there is a real chance that we're gonna face a significant problem and, and it's a matter of policy about how we address that and societal evolution. One aspect of that's very important is that companies advertise, it's the interest of, of maker, make people who make goods to advertise, encourage people to buy more goods. Much harder to get people to think about how to constructively use their leisure time. There's not a countervailing power. So I at least that's a, something that one ought, ought, ought to think about. The second question uh, was that uh, 
is there any difference between centralized and decentralized countries in the way they handle inequality? Well, the first thing I would emphasize, uh, point out is particularly in large countries, and Mexico is a large country for this purpose, uh, there are large variations of wealth across the country in different regions. You, you have it north and south. The uh, United States ha has very large differences. So the issue isn't so much whether there is centralization versus decentralization, but there has to be some kind of regional redistribution. So there is no way in which uh, the poorer parts of the country can compete with the richest parts of the country unless there's some kind of redistributive mechanism. But I actually think it has to go uh, beyond that. Uh, if you look at where the American South was going, its income was much lower than the American North. They were not educating uh, African Americans who were living there. Uh, it was a divided, we were two different countries. And it was only when the federal government said, you have to have minimum wages, you have to do, you know, we took very strong actions to try to bring the country together, that that gap started being reduced. Uh, so I think that there needs to be some degree of centralization, not only in resources, but also in motivation and in, in setting up national standards. Other, otherwise, it is often the case that you have uh, local elites that run the country, the, the, that part of the world for their own interest, and uh, very hard to get the kind of equality agenda that I think would make a difference. Uh, and I think that what I described in the American South, I think is true in many other parts uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the world. Um, the uh, one part of inequality that I haven't stressed is, is uh, the inequalities that arise out of various kinds of discrimination, mm. uh, racial, ethnic, and gender discrimination. And, you know, uh, things are better now than they were, but we have to, you know, when people say, oh, just market forces, I think that's wrong. The fact that we have societies with as much discrimination as we have uh, shows that it's not just market forces that are shaping inequality in our society. Now, I, I see that very forcefully. You know, I grew up uh, in Gary, Indiana, uh, which was uh, uh, an industrial town. But as I was growing up, you couldn't ignore the racial discrimination that was just rampant there. And uh, in 1960s, uh, you know, that we had a strong march. The young people said, you know, this is unconscionable. A century after the freeing of the slaves, that we still have this level of discrimination. We passed all kinds of civil rights laws and things like that. And now we're 65 years later, and we still have high levels of discrimination. Uh, employment, housing, just, you know, we, we had this 2008 crisis. One aspect that came to light after the 2008 crisis was the banks were discriminating against African American and Hispanics. They, you know, people equally qualified for loans. If you were African American or Hispanic, you paid a higher interest rate. And they targeted African American Hispanics. And when I say that they, these are America's largest banks that were doing this. They targeted them for predatory lending. So it, this shows you the battle that our societies have to face. You know, you're not gonna solve it by legislation but legislation helps move the dialogue. And I think it's really important, you know, I think the consciousness has been raised. And I think this episode of, in 2008, uh, the, the kind of discrimination is, has refocused the attention on, on, on this kind of uh, uh, discrimination. But I wanna come back to the, the, the gender differences because even though the, we've broken the glass ceiling uh, in many ways, we have, a woman, one of my students is the uh, head of the Federal Reserve. We have a woman who's head of the managing director, uh, managing director of the IMF. They've been doing absolutely fantastic jobs. Uh, and that's changed, I think, people's perceptions. Um, there are many of us who think that we may not have had a crisis 
if we had had women, more women in the financial institutions, they would have acted more responsibly, uh, uh, less recklessly, and more morally than uh, so, so I think there there is a uh, uh, there was a, a, a very big uh, 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 conference a couple of days ago sponsored by the Institute for New Economic Thinking, bringing women financial leaders together. But there's one more aspect that I think is really important: is that we have to structure our society to make it easier for people to balance work and life, and family leave policy, childcare. There are a whole set of uh, uh, economic frameworks, legal frameworks, that I think will uh, facilitate the elimination of this long, long legacy of discrimination. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, I'm afraid we've run out of time, but thank you for really a fascinating discussion. We've covered a lot, and you know, inequality, you know, is great to know that it's not inevitable. And uh, I think we've covered economic growth, structural reforms, human capital, education, learning societies. Um, uh, TPP and, and trade, and now a technology and gender. So it's been a fascinating ride with you, and thank you very much for your time and your insights.